If you have any questions, you can email me at theocrat at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-E-O-C-R-A-T at gmail.com. Also, if you could leave a review on iTunes or Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, I would appreciate that. It helps people to find the show. This is my testimony that I gave at my church. So when I was really, really little, the law was my schoolmaster. It taught me all sorts of things about myself. It taught me that I was a sinner, uh, which is the first step to understanding the gospel. Um, I remember my conversion. It was I was probably seven or eight years old. Um, Dad would come in and read to us every night. And I remember one night, instead of reading to us, he asked me a couple of questions. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with uh, Evangelism Explosion. Uh, the first question is, uh, do you know for sure that you're going to be with God in heaven when you die? And I think I told him, I don't know. I'm not sure. And so the second question is, if God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? And I told him I, I didn't know. I knew he was going to tell me the answer, um, but I told him I didn't know. Um, and then he gave me, before he answered that question for me, he gave me an illustration. He said, what if, Adam, what if you did something so bad that I, I had to give you a hundred licks with the belt? And the standard up to that point was three. <laughs> So I started crying immediately because I, it, it sort of made me realize the fact that he could ask that question made me realize that I need to be prepared to answer that question. It also made me realize that I'm capable of much worse things than deserve three licks with the belt. And so he said, what if your older brother Tyler took in and took those hundred licks for you? How would you feel about your older brother? And I started crying at that point, and I understood the gospel, I think, at that point. So that was sort of the beginning of my spiritual growth. Um, that was that that kicked off a whole bunch of different things in my life. Um, the things that have been key in my spiritual growth, I think number one has been my parents, um, the daily teaching that they've given me, the the videos that we have watched together, the daily devotions that we do, sometimes for a couple hours. Of, a day, not usually, but it can go that long. We've watched DVDs on creationism. We've talked through presuppositional apologetics. We've read books on how to resolve conflict. We've gone through church history. We've gone to eschatology conferences, biblical economics conferences, all sorts of things that have prepared me for a life of work now that I'm a believer and a life of growth. Um, there are, there are many different examples of things that I can think that my dad has told me. S really, really simple things at the perfect moment that led to a growth and sort of an unlocking of a future path for me. Um, I remember one time um, Amy and I were having some sort of a disagreement on our way out to go somewhere to either eat with friends or something like that. And... Amy had already gone out the door and was in the car waiting and dad's pulled me aside for a minute and very, very purposefully. And he said, that's your wife. And I can just remember my, my brain sort of expanding. Like I could, I'm, I'm sure I could have told you that. Yeah. Like, yeah, marriage isn't, isn't all, um, butterflies and roses. Sometimes it has to be going through really hard things. And of course I could have told you that, but it, but for my dad to give me a, a very specific illustration that of a conflict that I was having right now. And I was upset with my sister was very, very effective for me. Um, and I can think of many such, such situations, things like that, that he said, um, he directed my education in so many different ways, just through school. Um, but then sort of over the top of school and learning all sorts of things, um, in history and science, math, grammar. We love grammar. Um, he's also taught me to realize and go back and examine the things that I think I know and reevaluate my education and figure out where there are holes in it, where I've learned something wrong, and how to go back and correct that. And also correct the way that I live my life out through that. Um, so it not only has to change my way of thinking 
it can't stay just in my way of thinking. It has to translate out into changed actions where, where that's applicable. Um, we've also discussed ad nauseum as a family, um, theological aspects of all sorts of different things, politics and the news, economics effects of government handouts, um, school systems, police systems, prison systems, uh, anything that you can think of. We've probably discussed it for, for, for days. And I think that's very helpful because there's so many things that, that principles of law and salvation pertain to that have to translate out into our life and then into society. I remember, I think it was Van Til that said, culture is religion externalized. And my parents and upbringing have, have done a very good job of helping me to see sort of the seeds and the fruit of certain ideas. Um, another thing that's been key in my spiritual growth is just living out my faith. Um, evangelism is, is one of the key parts to that. Um, I haven't been as nearly as, as zealous for evangelism as, as I should. Um, but I've shared the gospel one-on-one -on -one with probably 15 or 15 people or so. Um, and I've got some stories to share. Um, the, the method for evangelism, I really didn't, didn't develop any sort of a stomach for it at all because it is, it is definitely uncomfortable to start doing it, especially the way that uh, the way of the master teaches. It's pretty in your face and gets people to think and either become angry or one of which, one of which is my stories. Um, but it's sort of modeling the way that I came to faith, which, which was a foundation of law first. And then through that realizing, um, realizing the need of the savior. And you really don't realize that you'll have a need of that until you realize that you're a sinner first. Um, I remember one time I was sitting in a restaurant and there was a guy next to me and I was alone. I was expecting somebody and which, and they never showed up. And there was another guy that was alone. So I went over to him and I shared the gospel with him. And then afterwards he said, I'm going, if you keep talking, I'm going to clock you were his words. Um, and so I stopped and I told him, I'm telling you this because I care about you and how, how uh, malicious would a doctor have to be for somebody to have cancer and not tell them about it. Uh, and I don't think he heard me. Um, and he, and he got irate at me and started insulting me. So I got up and I paid his tab and then I left. Um, another one was I was at a, an open carry rally I don't know if y'all if y'all saw any of that stuff on the news with people carrying rifles around, trying to get um, open carry of handguns passed, legalized in Texas. I was one of those guys walking around on the streets handing out uh, law and materials and things like that. And I remember sitting down at a at a Raising Cane's restaurant afterwards, and there are all these guys, and we all stuck our rifles over in the corner. And I thought to myself, I was I was really convicted at that point because I thought. Adam, here you are doing something really uncomfortable that most people would never dream of doing. Uh, and you're, you're not thinking in terms of the gospel. You're thinking in terms of, of changing a law. A good law needs to be changed. But there's something that's more important. There's, there's a foundation that should work ourselves, that should work these laws out into society. So let's start with that. So at the table, I witnessed to a couple of guys and one of them, as far as I can tell, um, understood. He heard, he heard the call of the gospel. Um, I, unfortunately, he's pretty far away. I haven't been able to keep up with him. Um, but that's one of the things that really encourages me. There's, there's really hard stories. There's people that react very poorly. And then there are some people that react uh, extremely well. And you can, they immediately want to start talking to you about other things relating to the gospel. It's a very encouraging Thing. If you've never if you've never led somebody to Christ um, and discussed and explained that through them to where the Holy Spirit can open up their hearts, um, it's one of the most encouraging things that I think can happen to you. Um, so evangelism has been a, a large part of my growth, not as large as it should be. Another thing that's really influenced my spiritual growth is worship. Um, and it's not just worship 
on Sunday, it's worship throughout the rest of the week. Um, it's a continual sacrifice through my works, through my, through my treating of others, how I love others. Um, and also through just my, just my work for, for money, for business. Um, uh, some of you know that I'm a video producer and the first couple of documentaries that I made were so bad and needed to be corrected so much. It was an incredibly hard thing to do, like just showing it to my family and receiving the corrections that they have for it. Um, there, that was a sacrifice. It's literally offering up something that I have worked on and allowing it to be pulled to shreds and basically destroyed right in front of me. And that's a very, that's a very healthy thing because that sacrifice has led to better work and more work in that area. Um, also, also art. I love film. I love music. Um, that's another type of sacrifice that you can make to God in your own, in your singing, in your family worship, um, painting, all sorts of things, prayer, um, and also humility. Um, I think the purpose of failure, uh, for all sorts of things, God has a great purpose for failure. Um, another thing would be challenges in conflict. I think some of the strongest trees that we have on our property are ones that have had many branches broken off by storms, uh, and they're still there. And you have to wonder, is that because they were strong that they were just able to take that or are they made stronger by certain things being broken off of them that are weak and don't need to be there? Um, learning by action. Uh, is definitely something that that a challenge in conflict will bring to or will bring to your to your mind. Um, piano comes to mind. Uh, took piano for a number of years, and there's only so much piano that you can learn by just reading a book about it. You actually have to work it out. It has to come. It has to come out of your hands, and you learn where your mistakes are, and it basically just illustrates everything that is deficient in your, in your book learning. If you're reading a book about sight reading over and over and over and over, and you don't know how to sight read, then something needs to change in the way that you practice in order for that to take root in you. Um, another thing for, another challenge would be um, either giving or accepting correction. That's something that I don't do nearly as well as I should. Um, in terms of giving correction, I can't think of a particularly um, noteworthy case. In terms of receiving correction, I think receiving, receiving a correction properly was probably the best teacher for how to actually go out and give correction um, because of the attitude that I sensed in the other person and that they weren't just doing this because they disagreed with me on something. They did this because they really cared about me and they saw something terrible. Um, I remember there was a film that I worked on in Virginia and I had that uh, very fuzzy memories. I love the movie. It's the favorite project that I've ever worked on. And I had a, the, a friend who was working over me at that point. I was the boom operator. He was the sound mixer. And he told me several years later, that he never would have worked with me again based on my behavior on that film. And that's totally changed the way that I think of serving others. Um, I was, I was lazy on that film and I could tell that he was telling me this. One of the reasons was because he had waited several years. He, I could tell that he was definitely not sure whether he wanted to actually say something to me, if I would take it or not. Um, I wish that he had given it to me earlier, even if I hadn't been willing to take it because I wouldn't have, because now, after that correction, I'm having to go back and sort of undo memories and thoughts and recollections that I have based on wrong information that I had um, about myself and about my attitude. Um, but I was extremely thankful for him. Still have a great relationship with him. I'll talk to him on the phone every once in a while. Um, and I think that was one of the, one of the largest things regarding my spiritual growth is receiving correction, just straight up hard correction. Um, another thing in 
Now the challenge would be seeing fruit in other people's lives that I don't necessarily agree with. I don't agree with their theology, but I can still see fruit in their lives. And thanks to my training that my dad has given me, I can actually go back and reason through why they have this particular fruit, even though their theology is wrong in, an, in another related area. Um, that's, that's also been very helpful for me. Um, it's the, you know, it's the whole legalism question. Is this wise? All things are lawful. Not all, not all things are profitable. Um, and realizing that getting to work with people that have the same goals that I do, that, that believe very differently, um, that are still, that are still Christians all within the realm of Orthodox Christianity. And that can relate to films that you watch, music that you listen to, ministries that you partake in. Um, I see people that have ministries that I, I'm sort of like, oh, what's the big deal? I don't really see anything about that. That's so important to go, to go for, to dedicate your life for. And God has placed them in that position, and he has not placed me in that position. He gives different people different things to carry out the work that he needs to do. That's not to excuse um, unwise practices, just straight up things that are not, that are not helpful for the kingdom of God. Um, but God has different callings for us. There are different things that are wise for us to pursue. Um, reason debate online is probably one of the most interesting, interesting things and most engaging things for challenges and spiritual growth. Um, I can hardly remember, uh, a fortnight that's gone by where dad hasn't pulled something up on his phone that a friend of his has posted and we'll pick it apart as a family discussion, um, and reason through. And along with that has gone, has, has gone a very strong, uh, command to also be humble online because there are a lot of things said that should never be said and how to do that in my own reasoning online and to be careful of that, that this is not an anonymous thing. Even if your username is something totally unrelated to you, God knows. And if anybody ever finds out they, they need to be able to see Christ there. So being graceful, winsome, and humble online, very hard on myself, hard on my own reasoning, re willingness to listen, and a slowness to speak, um, working it out and actually doing it in an online debate can be very, very challenging and I think very practical. Um, so why are we at the Lord's table? Um, we have a, I've got a video, some of y'all saw that pulled up. So I'll go ahead and play that just to sort of uh, answer this last question, start answering this last question. You see these people in this frame? They're the only, they're one of the only things in the entire universe that does not submit to God's will. The solution for this is Passover. During the Passover, there were four cups that the Jews had added. It's not commanded to drink four cups of wine throughout the Passover. That was an addition that came later on. But Christ took that illustration, the third cup of the Passover, the one immediately after the meal, was a cup of redemption. And he said, this is my blood. It was a bride price that he paid for his church. I'll read uh, Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried out our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was trust, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear the iniquities. And therefore I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. There are two elements to the Lord's table. The first is the bread, and Christ is illustrated in that as a grain of wheat. In John twelve twenty four, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The second symbol is the cup. <sighs> wine is made from grapes. And the way that you get wine is by crushing grapes. So we're here ultimately to celebrate a newer and better Passover. God grew a seed and crushed the fruit. With the blood of the new covenant, we drink it for the very reason that Leviticus forbids us from eating blood because there's life in this blood. Adam used life in the garden, fruit from a tree to bring about death. God used death, Christ's work to bring us to life. I pray that we will rejoice that God will, has promised to crush the fruit of our lives to bring about salvation to the world. And may we be fruitful. Let us worship in our work with hands that have been made clean by God, that may, we may walk in his righteous deeds, which is the purpose of our salvation. This is my prayer this morning. Amen.